Um, my name is Rihanna Putnam. I'm the Community Engagement Specialist for the Citizen Science Association. I'm joined today by Dr. Leah Shanley, who's a senior fellow at the Nelson Institute at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She's an advisor for SciStarter and a member of the steering committee for our Law and Policy Working Group. Um, Leah's coordinated this webinar series and will be moderating today's panel discussion. Um, I just have a few remarks about CSA and a few housekeeping things, then I'll turn it over to Leah to introduce our panelists. So for those of you that are unfamiliar, the Citizen Science Association is a member-driven organization that connects people from a wide range of experiences around a shared purpose of advancing knowledge through research and monitoring done by, for, and with members of the public. This work takes place in almost every discipline and requires a wide range of skills. Our efforts are concentrated into a biennial conference, a peer-reviewed journal, and member services such as our working groups, online networking, and webinars like these. Our membership represents the multidimensional and multi disciplinary nature of the field and includes project leaders, researchers, educators, and more. Our membership do support the association's member or mission and activities, and we encourage you to join or renew. You can find details on our website at the link on the screen. Getting involved with the CSA is a great way to make connections, grow as a leader in the field, and help support the association. Our working groups are one of the key ways that we work to advance the goals of the CSA through the sharing of resources, best practices, and relevant information both among group members and also to the broader citizen science community. The Law and Policy Working Group is one of eight working groups that explores cross-cutting issues like ethics, data and metadata, environmental justice, and more. The Law and Policy Working Group is always accepting new members. If you're interested in getting involved, you can head over to our website. We'll share a link in the chat shortly. Um, they have uh, bi-monthly calls, um, and you can see some of the upcoming call dates listed um, here on their website. This webinar will be recorded and uploaded to a YouTube playlist where we archive all of our past webinars on topics such as volunteer engagement, research ethics, and legal issues in citizen science. We have a lot of webinars coming up in the next coming months, um, including one next Thursday on engaging volunteers for long-term monitoring program success um, with some of our friends from the water, water monitoring world. Um, so we're excited for that one. The Law and Policy Working Group is also coordinating more in their series, um, and they have a couple coming up on the policy special issue where they'll be sharing case studies um, at a date in February and also in April, um, and some more that you can see there. We do have a few coming up with our ethics working group as well. So if you're interested in learning more about those, we'll be sharing event um, registration notices and more on our website. And we're really excited to start this today. Um, we love having these free webinars and really believe that community supported webinars, um, particularly those from our working groups and led by volunteers, shouldn't be paywalled. Um, if you find value from this learning opportunity and are in a position to pitch in, you can help cover some of the costs to keep these webinars free for those who can't pay. Um, I'll put a link in the chat or you can simply text webinar to the number 44-321 um, to get a link to the donation page. Lastly, we are expecting quite a few on the call today and we have everybody in listen only mode. Um, we do encourage you to introduce yourself, say where you're from in the chat box so we can get to know you better and you can get to know each other. If you have any questions, um, feel free to post them there and Leah will help make sure that our presenters um, see those and we'll try to respond to them either in the chat box or at the end we'll have some time for questions and answers. Um, if you are interested in live tweeting, and if that's um, your thing, please do so. You can um, tweet us at SITSCI policy or and SITSCI webinar um, to help others keep stay in the loop with what we're talking about here today. All right, and with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Leah. Thank you, everyone. Wonderful, thank you very much, Rihanna. And I want to uh, applaud Rihanna and Jennifer Shirk and the other members of the team uh, at Citizen Science Association for making these webinars possible. There's a lot of work that goes into this. And so I want to thank uh, Rihanna and, and others for all that effort. Um, today's discussion will be on privacy. Uh, privacy discussions tend to revolve around the implications of passive collection of individuals' data, what is often overlooked, however, is the different phenomena of the active sharing of data within the framework of citizen science. Starting from this premise, this webinar will explore from the perspectives of academic researchers, practitioners, and project leaders and ethicists, what are the challenges of meeting data collection needs while protecting participant privacy? What policies and best practices are needed 
From the theory and practice, we will reflect on how to ensure citizen science stays privacy fit while expanding its outreach impact and potential. So we have an absolutely great lineup today from the US and the European Union. And I would like to start with introducing uh, Bob Gelman. Uh, he is a lawyer uh, specializing in privacy and information policy. He's been involved in privacy policy for over 40 years. And as a consultant, Bob helps clients to do the right thing with personal data that they process. He was a staff, uh, professional staff on the House of Representatives Subcommittee for Government Oversight for 17 years and has served as a term, uh, served his term as a member of the Health and Human Services Advisory Committee on vital and health statistics. Bob and I have known each other not quite a decade, uh, but he was a, a fantastic uh, author and collaborator with our Wilson, Wilson Center's Commons Lab, writing a report on the privacy issues for citizen science. Um, we'll ask people to add their questions to the Q&A box. You can see the icon at the bottom of your screen or in the chat box to the right and we will save the questions for the end of the presentation. So we will have uh, about 20 minutes or so for group discussion at the end. With that, I'll hand it over to Bob. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, what I'm gonna do today is try and provide some kind of overall perspective on privacy, mostly from a US uh, perspective, because the laws are different in other countries. Um, I, I wanna talk very briefly about the report that I did in 2015 for uh, the Woodrow Wilson Center on federal government issues with respect to citizen science. And there are a number of laws that you kind of wouldn't think of normally that turned out to be relevant. Um, just a couple of examples, the Paperwork Reduction Act, which controls information collection by federal agencies. The point of the law is to stop agencies from collecting information from uh, individuals or businesses without some kind of control. Um, another law that's relevant but pretty weird is something called the Anti-Deficiency Act that actually uh, uh, tries to control an agency from basically um, uh, making commitments to people that will exceed uh, what they're allowed to do in budget. So accepting volunteer services runs the risk, um, at least in theory, of violating the Anti-Deficiency Act. There are ways around this, but um, there it is. The Privacy Act of 1974 is a law that applies to federal government agencies. Um, and that may be relevant depending on the role of the agency in a citizen science project. And the lesson of all of this um, is that in a government context, there may be laws relevant to a citizen science activity that really wouldn't you wouldn't think of normally because they're far afield from the specifics of what it is you're doing. So sometimes when you're doing this in a government context, and that's important, you need to step back, take a broader look, um, consult with others uh, who may know something about uh, rules that apply to government agencies um, and see what it is you need to think about. Um, now in the US, um, unlike virtually every place else in the world, there is no generally applicable privacy law. Um, so there are some state laws um, and the state law uh, landscape is changing very rapidly now. A California law that many of you probably have heard of took effect on January 1st, and other state legislators are looking at that law and elsewhere and thinking about changing what it is that they, uh, um, what kind of laws they might pass and who they apply to. The point about some of the state laws and some of the federal laws that are out there, and I'll talk about a few of them briefly, is they often apply only to commercial entities. So the California law, you have to be a slightly larger commercial entity. I think it's $25 million or I have information on so, so many thousands of people. And these laws just may not apply to citizen science projects unless there is a commercial entity involved. And even if there is, there's likely to be a way to evade the law, depending on how you wanna set up what you're doing. Um, laws that may be relevant at the federal level one of them is known as COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. Um, this applies only to commercial companies that are collecting information from kids under the age of 13 online. And basically, the law says you need to get parental consent, and there are complexities about that. Um, another law that could come up 
um, more likely to come up, at least in a citizen science context, is FERPA. It's the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act, and this applies privacy rules to schools that are receiving federal funds. And depending on, if you're involved with a school, depending on how your project is set up and what the role of the school is, um, FERPA will need to be examined and the schools themselves are not likely to know all that much about the law. Uh, another law that may be uh, discussed is something known as HIPAA. It's the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. It's a general purpose privacy, health privacy law. However, what's important to know about this law is it really only applies to healthcare providers and insurers, and it applies to all the health data that they have. It does not apply to health data in the hands of somebody else. Now, it could, could apply if you're a business associate of, of a provider or insurer, but anyone out there who is not a provider or insurer who's collecting health data is not subject to HIPAA, and there's a lot of health data that is not subject to HIPAA. Um, I want to talk a little bit more generally now about privacy and, and how to think about it in the context of citizen science. Um, I sort of have three different uh, frameworks to look at it from. First of all, the citizen scientists themselves uh, who are participating in a project and collecting data. The project that's running, uh, that is, that is, that is uh, using these people, will likely have information about these citizen scientists. It may be names, it may be emails, it may be location, age, other th information. That information is personal information, often personally identifiable information, and it needs attention. A second set of data subjects, if you will, are people on whom data is collected. Um, now, uh, you may collect data in a whole variety of ways, um, there may be interviews. Um, you may collect public data uh, um, from states or other places. You may have an observational study, even on a street corner, who knows, uh, an internet survey, anything is possible, but you may collect identifiable information on individuals. And there are a lot of issues here about who these people are, um, whether they know about what you're doing, a lot of times they will, and what kind of consent they have given to the activity uh, that they're contributing to. Um, the third perspective I wanna talk about is what are the obligations of record keepers, the people that are running citizen science programs, the sponsors. Um, the obligations of record keepers um, is really, I think, a main focus here because personal data is an asset. Personal data is a liability. Um, all kinds of things can happen if you have personal data. You could have a data breach and arguably might be subject to a state data breach laws, although many of those only apply in a commercial context. Um, you could have a lawsuit. You could be doing work on something and some business doesn't like what you're doing and decides to sue you to try and get access to your data or for some other purpose. Um, who knows what could happen, but if you have data, you have responsibility. And to talk about this, as soon as I find the right button. That wasn't it. Well, at any event, you can see that you can see the slide. Um, what I want to talk about is, you know, how do you think about privacy? And one way to do this, and a very important way, is to Think about fair information practices, which have a long history. Um, and actually, fair information practices are, are, are the basis for almost every national privacy law. If you look at them, uh, what you find in the EU and in many other countries, you will find all of these fair information practices represented in some fashion. Um, what I tell my clients who have to deal with privacy is your basic obligation is to do the right thing. Um, what that means in any given context uh, may vary. Um, what you do in a commercial context where you're using data to make a profit is one thing. Um, uh, what, you, uh, what you do in a scientific uh, uh, circumstance is something else. The same practices here will apply in some fashion. And I don't have really time to go through them all, um, but this is a general privacy checklist. What it is you should think about as a citizen science sponsor. 
Um, this is, uh, these are, this is the outline. This is a checklist. When I go to a website, if I look at their privacy policy, policy to see if it's any good, I go through these eight principles and see have they addressed all of these in some fashion. There are multiple ways of doing it, carrying out each principle, but if they haven't done all of these, then I think something is uh, insufficient. And of course, I can look at a specific principle and see have they, have they applied the principle in some fair and reasonable way. Um, that provides me as a data subject with some degree of protection. If you're a citizen science sponsor, I would urge you to have a privacy policy, whether it's required by law or not. And in the US, it is often not required. And in order to set up a privacy policy, I would recommend that you start with fair information practices and you see how you can address each of the principles here and provide some kind of information to to, the, to your own staff, to the citizen science scientists that you're working with, or to data subjects, or to the world, this kind of policy statement should be available on a website. Um, and uh, it's a way of letting everyone know what it is you're gonna do with information. Uh, let me stop there and uh, move on to the next speaker. Wonderful, thank you, Bob, appreciate that. Um, before we move on, there's one question here. We'll just take one question while we queue up the next speaker uh, slides. Um, are there any differences between authorized and unauthorized use of data? Um, sure, I mean, it depends who's authorizing it. You know, there's, there's, uh, there are data uses that are authorized or required by law. There are data uses that could be authorized with the consent of the data subject. Um, it's really context specific. You need to know more than just authorized and unauthorized to figure out exactly what it is that's going on. Okay, wonderful, thank you. So do we have uh, Anna's slides queued up? So while we're waiting for that, I will introduce Anna. Uh, Anna Bertie Suman is a PhD researcher at the Tilburg Institute for Law, Technology and Society in the Netherlands, and she's also a current visiting researcher at the Joint Research Commission uh, in uh, Ispera in Italy, working with our one of our favorite citizen scientists, um, Sven Schade. Uh, her PhD project aims at investigating how grassroots driven citizen sensing can challenge and ultimately influence environmental risk governance. Anna has work and research experience in environmental risk policy in Ecuador, water management from Chile and public health sector in London. And with that, I'll hand it over to Anna. Yes. So welcome everybody and thank you for being here tonight for the European and this afternoon for the US based audience. This afternoon, I'm going to tell you about this topic that has been, I think, triggering a lot of attention, both from the EU and at the US side, which is balancing citizen science data collection needs and privacy protection. And I will share with you the perspective of the European Union, especially because we realize that the reflection and the studies from the European side are actually at the moment scarce. So who I am, just a few words. I am based at the Tilburg Institute for Law, Technology and Society. And I was saying the, this is exactly the right place where to kind of ask these questions. But I'm also based at the European Commission um, Joint Research Center within the citizen science data team which are also very much involved in questioning the possible privacy risk and implication related to the use of citizen generated data, both in policy and in science. So with that, I will start bringing you through our study. So Robin Pierce, also based at the Tilburg Institute for Law Technology and Society TILT in the Netherlands, and me recently explored, um, uh, let's say, scarcely researched fields, which is the possible tensions that are between the citizen science and open science agenda currently fostered by the European Union and the GDPR, which is also pushed by the European Union as the data protection privacy standards currently at the European level. 
So challenges, yes, but also opportunities, because as we said in the opening, the GDPR is ultimately a means to assure that citizen science projects are ultimately privacy fit. And both citizen science and open science are processes started in the 90s or even before, but the GDPR is actually applicable as of 2018. So this new regulation, how can it trigger an improvement in citizen science or rather hinder its potential? So first of all, for the people that are not that familiar with the GDPR, I think it's worth spending a couple of words on the key aspects of the GDPR. So the GDPR is the General Data Protection Regulation um, is uh, applicable to all individuals within the European Union and the European Economic Area, but it also addresses the export of data outside Europe. So for example, to the US. It was adopted in 2016 and is implemented as of 25th of May 2018, so re relatively recently, which also means there is very much discussion, but kind of still a need of adaptation so far. And among the key elements that I will be discussing tonight are actually the principles, the right of the data subject, the figure of the controller and processor, and the point on transfers of personal data to third countries or international organizations that may be outside the European Union. So first of all, the GDPR is based on seven principles, which says that processing of personal data is lawful, provided that it follows basically a number of conditions. What is Processing of personal data. First, what is personal data? Personal data is any data about an identified or identifiable individual. And processing is the collection, organization, structuring, storage, alteration, and so on of this kind of data. So among the seven principles, we have lawfulness of processing we have purpose limitation, data minimization, storage limitation, and accountability. And I will show you how this principle may somehow create some frictions with the goals and approach of citizen science and open science at a broader level. So first of all, when we are talking about lawfulness in citizen science, we need to make a distinction between the passive sharing of data and the active data sharing. So for passive data collection, we may think to an unintended collection of our personal data through use of a mobile phone app. For active data sharing, we are thinking about uh, participants joining freely a citizen science project and actively sharing, for example, data on biodiversity, right? If the data subject as given consent to the processing, or if the processing is aimed to perform a task in the public interest, then there is a lawful base for processing personal data. Now, when you're talking about citizen science, we may talk about consent, but we may also talk about task in the public interest, which doesn't mean that the right and freedom of the data subject shouldn't be protected, but it means that there is a lawful base for this process. So other two aspects that are important here are the role of data controllers, which are particularly tricky for citizen science projects, and I will show you why. And the need and possibility to pseudonymize data as a sort of additional safeguard for the data subjects, which may again create attention for the citizen science project's aims. So the very question that we entered through with our study was actually wondering whether the data processing requirements under the GDPR represent the possible endurance to the advancement of citizen science. And we focus specifically on citizen science for health research. And this is an important disclaimer for the also following presentation, because we are talking about particularly sensitive data in citizen science, data 
on health status, which are considered the sensitive data, which are data that are kind of, which undergo particular safeguards because regard, for example, health status, ethnicity, political opinion, sexuality, and so on. So among the possible tensions, and at this moment, I'm also linking to a speech of the president of the European Commission, which actually exactly balanced this need for opening up signs also through citizen science and respecting the data protection laws currently enshrined by the GDPR. So if we go into the letter of the law, but also if we go into the spirit of the law, we may see really conflicting, um, kind of conflicting uh, provisions. So for example, in Horizon 2020, we talk about a reuse culture, but on the other side, we're also pushing for purpose limitation, data minimization in the GDPR. So there may be two sort of possibly conflicting cultures, which may think, which may, we may need to harmonize to ensure that the two kind of strengthen each other rather than hindering the process, progresses of each other. So among the various tension, and I want to say this was an exploratory study and we just pinpoint a number of them but many more can come uh, to our mind. Um, first, the need that actually the aims of openness and participation in science actually could impinge and undermine the rights and freedoms of the data subjects. And this is why, because sometimes behind citizen science initiatives, market interest may be hidden. And I will show you why and how. So we choose um, the She Started as platform, we reviewed a number of health connected citizen science projects based all over the world. And for example, we picked the Cochrane Crowd, which is a citizen science initiative aimed at making better healthcare evidence for informing healthcare decision. And it's a very collective um, project, it's grassroots driven, it seems uh, very challenging also in terms of scope. However, we wondered to what extent the people that participate actually were giving a free, aware, actual consent to the possibly secondary use of the data that were fed into the platform. And to what extent they were aware whether there were market actors behind the platform, to what extent they were really aware of possible further uses of the data that they were feeding especially because we are talking about sensitive health data. So among the other tensions, we found a friction between the long-lasting and iterative nature of citizen science projects and the fact that you in general give consent at the beginning of a project, but you may not consent to the further uses. Second, some of the safeguards that the GDPR provides for, such as civil anonymization, may make particularly hard for some citizen science projects to um, develop. For example, citizen science projects with vulnerable communities, ethnic communities may still need sensitive data, kind of for the same aims of the project itself. Then again, there is another big tension, which is the need, as I was saying at the beginning, for a data controller, ex Article 26 GDPR. Well, a unique data controller in a scattered citizen science project can be particularly difficult. Who takes the responsibility? The participants, project coordinator, made the initiative have the resource to have and pay for such a data controller who takes this responsibility. And again, a number of projects of citizen science are scattered around the world. We need cross-border research data sharing. But the GDPR at the same time is asking for storage limitation, limit to cross-border data sharing. And this can hinder actually the cooperation among research. So we cannot come up here with solution and it's still very much in the pipelines. However, I think, and we, kind of came up with the idea that the GDPR is only one of the possible lens. There are many more frames and many, and possibly the US can learn from the EU and vice versa. But we found some good initiative, for example, the open research data pilot, 
that is actually trying to balance the openness, making open the data generated by Horizon 2020 with the need to protect personal and sensitive data. Experience such as SALUSCOV, which may aim to legitimize people's right to, can keep, to keep track of their health record while facilitating data sharing. This is a great project that is actually aiming to make people in control and aware of what is actually sharing and what they are sharing. Again, the idea of citizen science from below, from above, more institutionally driven citizen science can be a safeguard, but can also be a risk on the other side. We framed the idea of a right to science and more you can find in the paper that I can share privately. Whoever wish to access it could be balanced against right and freedom. The idea that processing in the public interest can be a lawful basis, but this may hold only for certain type of citizen science. And lastly, that if we use anonymous data but that cannot be feasible for all citizen science projects, we will basically be outside the GDPR and that the initiative is safe. So that said, I think there are no easy solution. I can just share a lot of questions and dilemmas. And I think in the next month, year, we will see this discussion really blossoming. I wish you can all join this discussion because I think we need practice, we need academia, we need everybody. So thank you for your time. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, Anna. Um, if we have one quick question while we're tying up uh, Daniel's presentation, um, otherwise we will save questions to the end. I want to introduce uh, Dr. Daniel Susser. He is an assistant professor in the College of Information Sciences and Technology and a research associate in the Roth Ethics Institute at Penn's uh, Penn State University. He's a philosopher by training and works at the intersection of technology, ethics, and policy. His research aims to highlight normative issues in the design, development, and use of digital technologies, and to clarify conceptual issues that stand in the way of addressing them through law and policy. So Daniel, if you want to unmute and put yourself on video, uh, if you have slides, we'll want to flip and do a share screening with you. Yep, so I, I don't think I can share mine until um, Anna turns hers off. Okay. Telling me that I can't share them yet. No, Anna, if you heard that, there we go. Okay, let's see. All right. Can you see them now? Yes, we can. Great. Okay, well, thanks very much, Leah. Um, yeah, so I was asked to talk about um, sort of ethical issues around um, data collection and use in citizen science. And so just to kind of um, frame what I'm going to be talking about, this is probably quite obvious, but I thought it was useful as a framing mechanism um, to just sort of glance at the relationship between ethics and the law. Um, so obviously, we generally hope that our laws approximate our ethical values, um, but the relationship between these two is not one of perfect one-to-one -one correspondence. Ethics and law overlap, but they're not the same thing. Um, many things that are illegal are not necessarily unethical, and many things that are unethical are not necessarily illegal. Um, so what I'm gonna try to do over the next few slides um, is focus on a couple of examples of situations you might run into where you're perfectly within legal compliance, um, but you still might run into some problems of um, ethical responsibility to the human data subjects that appear in your data sets. Um, so I have three examples. I think I will only have time to get to the first two. I'm gonna talk about um, problems with anonymization and problems with consent. Um, time permitting, I'll also talk about some emerging issues around bias and automated decision making. Um, if I don't have time to get to the bias examples, feel free to raise questions about them during the Q&A, and I'd be happy to talk about them then. So you've already heard a little bit about this, but anonymization uh, generally refers to the removal of identifying information from data sets. Um, and we have relied on anonymization as a sort of technique or strategy for preserving privacy very significantly. Um, and it is such that uh, le certain legal requirements that are generally placed on sensitive data, even the most sensitive data like health data, 
um, are often removed if someone anonymizes their data sets. So if you anonymize even um, health data sets in the United States, much legal, they're exempted from much legal regulation. Yet over the last um, three or so decades, um, we've learned time and again that anonymization is an imperfect strategy for guaranteeing data subjects privacy. Um, there are a few sort of famous failures of anonymization um, that I'll mention briefly. Um, in the mid 1990s, um, a government agency in Massachusetts um, that was in charge of regulating the insurance industry uh, released a public data set of hospital records from hospitals in Massachusetts um, in order to further medical science. Um, they anonymized the data set, removing names, social security numbers, and so on from the data. Um, but an enterprising researcher, Latanya Sweeney, who was then at MIT, was able to combine that public data set with other public data and by doing so to infer the identities of a number of data subjects contained in the original data set. Uh, famously, she was able to find the hospital records for governor, the governor of Massachusetts at the time, Bill Weld, and she mailed them to his office. Um, and we've seen this kind of thing happen time and again. A decade later in the mid 2000s, um, AOL released a huge data set to the public with over 20 million search records. Um, and researchers were able to combine that data set with other data and reveal the identities of individual searchers, search users who appeared in the data set. Netflix, similarly, in 2006, as a part of its Netflix prize contest, um, released over half a million data about over half a million Netflix users and their movie ratings. And within a couple of weeks, researchers were able to combine that data with data from IMDb and to identify the particular re uh, records of users in the original data set. Um, and so what we find is that anonymization is quite nice in, in, if you're looking at one data set in isolation. But as soon as you merge that data set with other data, um, the, the guarantees that anonymization promises fall away pretty quickly. In response to that, I mean, one thing that I think people should just keep in mind is that if you publicly release a data set, even if you've taken steps to anonymize it, you should just assume that that data set is going to be merged with other data sets at some point, and information contained within it could become uh, identifiable to particular data subjects. Um, there are um, sort of new emerging mathematical techniques for sort of making more robust anonymization guarantees, like differential privacy, which we can talk about. Um, but these techniques are also limited in their abilities. And so if you want to go sort of beyond your legal compliance requirements and really think about the ethical responsibilities that you have as data collectors towards data subjects, um, I think you should just assume that anonymization is an imperfect strategy and just assume that data you release um, will be identifiable at some point down the road. The second example, you've heard already um, a lot about consent. Um, it is the case, at least in the American context, that if you get consent from a data subject to collect data about them and to use it, um, there are virtually no limitations on what data you can collect and what you can do with it. Um, yet, privacy scholars have, for the last 20 years, pointed out the deep limitations of this approach. Um, I sort of tend to put them in four buckets. Um, one, normally our consent procedures are one time and all or nothing. So data subjects are given the opportunity either to participate in some practice or not. Um, they are asked once and then they're never asked again. Um, two, we know that privacy disclosures, um, terms of service, end user license agreements, these are very difficult to understand. They're written by lawyers for lawyers and the average data subject, the average end user um, can't really understand what they're agreeing to or not. Uh, three, these, this strategy doesn't scale. Um, so much information is collected about us by so many different parties um, that if the average you know, individual person were going to try to control the information flowing about them using a kind of notice and consent approach, 
they would be reading privacy policies from the moment they woke up in the morning until the moment they went to sleep at night. It's just not a strategy that scales. And finally, much like the worries I raised in the anonymization context, um, we know that data is usually not sort of processed in isolation, but rather combined with other data in order for it to be useful, for useful inferences to be made. Um, so when data subjects are asked to um, provide their consent for certain forms of data collection, um, it's very difficult for them to anticipate what actually could be inferred about them based on that data once it's combined with other data down the road. Um, so when they try to make a sort of cost-benefit analysis about whether or not it's worth it to them to reveal some information about them, we're asking them to make a decision um, about risks that are very difficult to anticipate at the point of consent. So for all of these reasons, even though getting consent from a data subject might satisfy your IRB or your other like RCR requirements, um, it leaves ethical questions on the table. So what do we do in the face of that? I think it's a big question that lots of people are trying to wrestle with. Two things I'll point to is one, even though consent most often is a one-time all or nothing proposition, there's nothing stopping you from engaging in what you might call continuous consent. So if you get consent from your data subjects to collect data about them and use it for a particular purpose, and you decide later that, oh my God, this data set would be super useful for some whole other thing, um, nothing's stopping you from going back to your data subjects, asking them for consent again for this new use of their data. Second, we might um, stop thinking about uh, the responsibility for ensuring privacy as resting entirely on the shoulders of data subjects. Um, we might want to think about data collectors as taking on more of that ethical burden. Um, one very sort of popular way of thinking about how to um, approach the ethics of privacy in that way is what philosopher Helen Nissenbaum calls contextual integrity. Um, this is a very rich theory. I don't have time to get into the details here. I'd be happy to provide information about it um, in the q and I'll just say at a very high level, what Nissenbaum argues is that while asking for consent is sometimes um, appropriate, sometimes the right way to go about legitimating data practices, um, as Bob mentioned at the beginning, um, a lot of our sort of norms of data collection, what is appropriate data collection and what is appropriate use, is inferable just from the context that we're operating in. So if I go to the doctor's office, um, I fully expect that the doctor is going to collect sensitive information about me. If I learned that the doctor shared some of that information with a colleague in order to give me a more accurate diagnosis, I probably wouldn't be terribly upset about that. Um, but if I learned that the doctor had shared that information with like pharmaceutical advertisers, I would probably be pretty upset. And I wouldn't be upset because I like read and signed a HIPAA notice. Um, I would be upset because the sort of intuitive privacy norms um, in the sort of doctor-patient relationship uh, suggest that that's not the right way to collect and share information. So data collectors should take it upon themselves to think about the context in which they're collecting data, the appropriate uses implicit in those contexts, um, and take some of that burden off of the data subjects. So I think I'm out of time. I'm, as expected, I'm not going to get to the bias question, but again, feel free to ask about it in the Q&A, um, and thanks very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Daniel. And if we have um, all our panelists kind of put on their cameras now and join in, although I know, uh, Anna, we were getting some feedback from yours, so maybe mute uh, unless you're going to be... Oh, I forgot the video. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, my bad. Uh, we do have one last panelist who could not join us in person. Uh, Kyle Kopas, he's the communications manager for GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, a network uh, and open data research infrastructure with a secretariat based in Copenhagen. He has often managed issues of intellectual property, licensing and privacy working primarily in the fields of managed um, fields of sustainable design, conservation and biodiversity uh, informatics. He currently oversees outreach engagement of GBIF stakeholders and audiences including a network of more than 1,500 institutions across 
130 countries, islands, and territories. So Kyle will give us kind of the real world, how do you implement this operationally in citizen science projects? Brianna, would you please clean that up? I'm communications manager at GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, which is an international network and research infrastructure that provides free and open access to primary biodiversity data for a wide range of research and policy uses. Given the conveners of this webinar, I hope you'll indulge me in a couple of disclaimers. First, I'm not an attorney. I'm a communications professional who's moonlighted as part-time in-house paralegal on intellectual property licensing and privacy issues for about the last 20 years. So what I have to share is based on counsel we received both before and after implementation of GDPR related changes, which is no small matter for us given that GBIF Secretariat is based in Copenhagen. Second, GBIF's position with regard to GDPR is not necessarily the same as that of our network members. However, our aim in talking in venues like this is to help them along, along with others in the communities we serve, to work toward implementing good policies and best practices with regard to personal data processing. So there are a number of instructive ways of looking at GBIF from the occurrence data that our network provides, shown here in this map, to our formal national participants, of which are close to 60, to the nearly 1,600 institutions worldwide in 130 countries or more that share data through our network. Meanwhile, some numbers can give you a sense that GBIF is a mature, robust, fully operational research infrastructure served by and serving thousands of participants, users, and other stakeholders each day. So the question remains, why should citizen scientists or citizen science practitioners care about something like GDPR? There's some general ideas sketched out below here, but in the case of GBIF, it has everything to do with citizen scientists' scale of involvement our own species has a deep history of observing the other inhabitants of the natural world, which means that citizen science is one of the few areas where biodiversity science community remains far advanced of many, if not most, other research domains. We began trying to analyze and quantify this relationship be beginning in 2016, when along with a team of international researchers, we used GBIF as a case study to understand the contribution of citizen science to international biodiversity monitoring. The results of this course, data, course scale data set level assessment discovered that something like 40% of the 644 million records then available through GBIF came from data sets likely to have significant contributions from citizen scientists. And while eBird remains the, by far the largest citizen science data set, as well as the largest single data set served through GBIF, millions more records come in through hundreds of other data sets covering more than just birds and from large and small projects around the world. Then a few months ago, a couple of colleagues of mine from the Secretariat, Marie Grosjean and John Waller, revisited this analysis. Marie used text mining techniques to update the data sets tagged as having substantial citizen science components. And John has run additional analyses to look at how these data sets continue to add to the rapidly growing total number of records. eBird now stands at 561 million, for instance. Citizen science do provide massive volumes of data for birds, but they provide less for other taxa, and thus far, despite the volume of data they provide, citizen science, scientists provide observations for far fewer species than other sources, many likely reasons why, including the difficulty of identifying some groups of species based on opportunistic photos. So back to GDPR. What do we talk about when we talk about personal data? The first definition laid out in Article 4 of the regulation spells out exactly who the data subject protected under this regulation is. That same definition also embeds a particularly important subclass of sensitive personal data as opposed to ordinary personal data. Thankfully for us, none of the personal data 
that GBIF processes falls into these sensitive areas, which makes life generally easier for biodiversity related citizen science projects when compared with, say, health data related initiatives. What we do have, though, are many names, names of specimen collectors or observers, names of those who identify tax, the taxonomic identif identity of an occurrence, names both from our professional network and from data users who provide us with email addresses when they download data. I want to focus on the collectors and identifiers, though, as this is the group that our community has been most worried about since the advent of GDPR. While one can essentially construct an occurrence record from any data source that includes a species or taxon identification, a date, and a location, these records are consistently improved by knowing more, that is, by greater transparency about its context and setting. For instance, it's important to know that it's important to know whether the identifier is a young student out on a class field trip or an expert naturalist, perhaps an amateur, who while not trained or employed as a scientist, may have considerable expertise in biological observation. Giving this information, carrying this information forward into the data can help give data users confidence necessary to choose whether to include or exclude certain data from their analyses. So, what if you're not in Europe? Are you really off the hook? Not so much. Um, the US privacy and protection framework is kind of a patchwork uh, compared to GDPR. The underlying concept of personally identifiable information is different from a, uh, a data subject. And in general, GDPR is pushing changes worldwide. Um, as can be seen by some of the legislative trends that other speakers in this webinar have probably already highlighted. So does that really mean then we've got to get permission for everyone who's ever contributed biodiversity data? The answer is no. First of all, maybe you are lucky or good and have a well-crafted privacy policy about sharing data, including users' names. But if not, you can consider updating it now. And while the run-up to the 25th of May 2018 placed nearly all the focus on unambiguous consent, it's only one of the six lawful bases for processing non-sensitive personal data under GPR. It's also one of the weakest, as it can be withdrawn. But there are other reasons that GBIF has chosen not to base its lawful processing on consent. And we claim instead that legitimate interests as the reason for us processing personal data in the way we do. In practice, such interests must be balanced against the rights and interests of data subjects. However, we believe that in any of these three balancing tests highlighted here, GBIF's own interests are complemented by those of stakeholders across the scientific community and, in fact, the public good. As a knowledge commons funded by the world's governments, we firmly believe that each balancing test weighs in favor of GBIF's position. So as I said at the top, we're committed to helping our scientific and stakeholder communities implement good policies and best practices with regard to personal data processing. And then in the coming years, we'll work with our participants and partners to adopt such policies and build trust among individuals, including the citizen scientists who make such critical contributions to the world's knowledge of the biosphere by ensuring the transparency and the quality the science supported by GBIF mediated data. And with that, I thank you. If you have questions about this, since I wasn't able to join you live, by all means, uh, contact me by email or on Twitter and hope to continue the discussion with all of you sometime very soon. Thanks. Wonderful. Uh, unfortunately, Kyle isn't here with us today, but he did provide his email address and encouraged you all, if you have questions about how they've implemented their privacy policy, uh, to reach out to him directly. Uh, with that, I'd like to invite Bob and Anna and Daniel uh, back uh, so that we can have some discussions. So a couple of questions have come in. Uh, I saw two come across at least one. Um, Lynn Chambers asked Daniel to maybe comment more on the bias. Uh, slide he was going to have and then an interesting question about 
kind of a little more on the labor side of things, the labor ethics of whether uh, researchers should be paying volunteers. Uh, so not maybe it has something to do with privacy, but I think it's a it's also a very uh, important question in the legal and policy and ethics space of citizen science. So Daniel, you want to hit the bias first? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Leah. Um, so yeah, bias is an emerging um, sort of deep worry in the, especially the, like the machine learning and AI community, um, to the extent that citizen scientists are going to be engaged in using data to make automated decisions. Um, bias is a question that they're that they should be worried about. Um, it's it's an enormous field. It's hard to summarize it in just a few words. Um, one thing I would say is that we one thing we've learned is that. Um, Due to the way machine learning and most AI systems are developed today, um, where instead of encoding sort of formal explicit decision making rules into systems, in fact, we rather um, sort of implicitly learn decision making rules from data, from training data, um, people who are worried about bias in their systems should pay very close attention to the training data they use to train their models. Um, they should think about whether or not um, all relevant um, social groups are represented in that data. Um, and then after the model is trained, they should really engage in a process of sort of continuously evaluating their model's performance um, against metrics that have been established in advance. Um, if there are really specific questions about um, data bias, I'm happy to delve into that further. Um, but at a high level, I'll just say that. Um, and I'm happy to provide uh, pointers to really useful and like practical guides um, for, for mitigating bias worries. Great, thank you. Um, so the question was Cheryl Watson had asked, uh, she's running a citizen science project uh, that is monitoring lead levels in, in water uh, in uh, volunteers' homes. Uh, the kits are free and provide high quality testing. Um, she asked specifically if researchers should be paying the volunteers for collecting this data, but what are the privacy concerns if you're, as well as if you're um, testing water in people's homes? So I know geolocation privacy uh, is part of the GDPR. It's being considered in some states as well. Um, is uh, recent legislations that are before some of the state legislatures, and then there's some ethical concerns about revealing people's home addresses. So open it to any of the panelists who want to jump in on that one. Oh, um, uh, this is Bob. Um, uh, I think that the issues that you raised are good. I think another thing is the health uh, information that's being uh, collected basically is your health being affected by lead in your water and who knows what could happen with that information how that might be used to characterize uh, residents of the home or kids there um, uh, that may be more serious than some of the other information uh, it's one reason why it's important to tell people what you're doing with data and what the consequences are um, before you ask them to collect I really can't talk to the question of uh, of uh, paying volunteers um, it's possible um, but it's sort of a, a set of issues that that's uh, beyond privacy although I will point out that if you're paying people it raises it means you have to collect more information social security numbers you may have to report things to tax authorities it's it's uh, it's another layer of complexity and I can chip in also mentioning the fact that at the moment, the JRC, so the European Commission, is really concerned about geolocation privacy, especially because public administration are increasingly being very concerned in the kind of adverse, like let's say, consequences of using geolocation data from citizen, from citizen generated data. So I would say that the location, like the address, plus the quality of the water, the lead levels, and the possible health consequences could easily, even without too much aggregation, end up in the hands of an insurance company, for example, and making prices higher for a neighborhood rather than the other. And this came with air quality monitoring, water quality, various type noise, um, odor. So I think it's when it's the home plus a sort of health sensitive data then it's definitely a risk. And that for the labor side, I think 
then the question is, it becomes sort of outsourcing labor. So I wouldn't, let's say, I, I would not dive as I'm not definitely an expert in these, but I think there is a strong discussion on intentions between people adversing kind of the idea of outsourcing tasks to volunteers because it doesn't make it volunteer anymore, especially as a public administration paying volunteers for doing citizen science. Then it becomes kind of cheap labor done for the public administration. But I also can see how that sometimes rewarding is needed, but maybe other forms of reward which are not paying, but just like theater tickets or plans, other types of also going beyond the money idea of always needing payment. Yeah. Diana, do you maybe want to tackle the, that's a little more of an ethical question, I think, about paying versus not paying volunteers. Oh yeah, so that question um, I'd have to think more about. I mean, it sounds to, that sounds to me like more of a sort of RCR, like responsible conduct of research question that I would definitely talk to your IRB about, even if you're not doing this research sort of like through the auspices of the university, um, they'll be good at thinking through the sort of costs and benefits of those kinds of questions. About the, um, the geolocational data, just quickly, um, I will point out like we, we tend not to think about um, information privacy today as, as having a whole lot to do with the particular places in which data is collected, but that but historically we have. Um, and historically the home was sort of considered like the most private place. And so even though our laws tend not to think about things in that way, I think the average person's expectations about their privacy are still indexed pretty significantly to the spaces in which data is collected. And I think it's especially, um, sh people should be especially cautious about collecting data about people and their homes and in their homes. Um, and one kind of just like example, this is totally speculative, but like an example for why you might worry about that kind of thing and like the harm that could come from revealing what seems like not even particularly um, personal information about a person's home is we've talked a lot of already about sort of merging different data sets. And if this data set were released publicly, it's not hard to imagine, you know, uh, like an insurance company that's insuring your home or a health insurance company that's insuring your, um, your medical policies, being very interested in whether or not there are high levels of lead in your home and adjusting your policies on that basis, you know? So that's something that's very speculative. I don't think that's happening now, but just as the kind of um, ethical harm that might exceed our existing legal requirements that you would want to have in mind when you're making these kinds of decisions. I think it's useful to think about that kind of thought experiment. Uh, can I add a thought? Yes, please. Um, uh, the pipe that delivers water to your house also delivers water, likely in most places, to your neighbors. So if you're giving up information about lead in your house, you're also sharing information about others who are on that same line, perhaps. And so it, it's it's not something, it, it, it's a complexity that relates in some ways to group privacy, which is a, a difficult concept, but it's out there and sometimes it's relevant. Yeah, we, that's a great point, Bob. Um, I dealt with collective privacy in my own dissertation with the context of data in Native American tribes. And there was a lot of work in the early or sorry, late 90s in the participatory mapping community about collective privacy, particularly uh, when you're doing uh, collaborative mapping or um, participatory mapping with uh, vulnerable populations. Uh, so that's something we, we very much need to be thinking about the impact uh, to those that if we as individual are providing data, who else we might be impacting. Um, we haven't much talked about imagery and privacy. In citizen science, we often take photos of the objects that we're trying to record uh, information about that may include the photos of people um, and now with some of the tools we see in the news, there's a company that is doing facial recognition. So it'd be very easy to find out who that person is and cross reference, reference it as Daniel mentioned with other databases to find their location. Uh, what can you advise citizen science projects with regards to imagery and privacy? Well, I'll offer one thought. Um, uh, you know, this is some of the part of this is, is uh, the issue of privacy in public and to what extent um, can you have privacy in public? And that's another very complicated, broad thing. But if you're taking imagery and if there are things that you are photographing that you don't need, like a face or a license plate, 
then maybe you can find a way um, uh, to, to uh, fix it so that information is not retained while the other information you're really looking for is retained. Anyone else of the panel want to jump in on that one? I may chip in mentioning the work that at the moment at my institute is uh, being uh, implemented by Berjab Corp on uh, privacy in public spaces and especially because the home has been seen as kind of the, the most private space. Now also a lot of attention is uh, given to privacy in public spaces, especially in the context of living lab or very uh, monitored public spaces. And I think there is a kind of a tension between the need of control. For example, a famous case in Eindhoven was the Stratum side. It's a street completely covered with webcams. And on one side, this really ensured the kind of lowering of, of risk and of um, kind of uh, crimes. But on the other side, it became kind of normal for people to be constantly tracked in crossing the street. So, for example, citizen science projects that are spreading in the Netherlands are also for kind of uh, violence detection. And in this case, of course, you need to take a picture. But on the other side, in the violence scene, there are many other faces that can be associated with the situation. So I would say in certain type of citizen science projects that you need to share pictures, for example, also an illegal waste dumping. You need to take really the picture, but then there may be an accidental on somebody working there, which is not at all connected to that. So I would say also you as a citizen reporting a picture, you should ask yourself, what are the implications for the other people in the picture? And if the other people in the picture matter for the citizen science purpose, like for example, they're part of the crime, then it's worth to share. But then, I mean, this second question should be in US citizen reporting, I would say. So Mm -hmm. I'll just add quickly, um, I think it's a really good question and I think it's really useful to think about different kinds of information, different like modalities that information comes in. We tend to sort of treat it as one abstract concept, but I think people have really different intuitions about their privacy interests in photographic information or sound information or um, you know, text data or whatnot. Um, we saw examples of this last year when there was a huge uproar about you know, Amazon Alexa's collecting audio recordings of people in their homes and their quality assurance teams listening to those recordings in order to improve the product. And I think one of the things we learned from that is that people just didn't understand what kind of data was being collected about them and how it was being used. And so I think if you're engaging in citizen science, and especially if you're engaging in um, programs that use passive data collection, you know, like there's a lot of like Health, um, health informatics programs that are being developed right now to collect information from smart speakers like Alexa's or whatnot. Um, it's really important to educate your subjects, not just to ask them sort of, can I collect this data, but to educate them about the kinds of sensors that are embedded in the products that they have, um, the kinds of information that will be collected, what it will be used for, and so on. And not to assume that people um, even really understand what kind of information can be collected from the kinds of devices that they have in their homes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I, I know we probably could have a whole webinar on that alone. <laughs> um, be mindful of time. We have three minutes before the end. There was one more question that came in. Uh, Kyle mentioned that GDPR applies to living people. Can anyone speak to its applicability to the deceased? Thinking of historical records that could be mined for biodiversity data or weather data, for example. Um, would anyone like to speak of the privacy of, of those who are no longer with us? Uh, I can talk about that a little bit. Privacy laws traditionally don't apply to uh, dead people, but it's more complicated than that. Um, uh, sorry, I'm trying to do something here and I don't know how to do it. But in any event, um, the, uh, um, I'll give an example, HIPAA. Or the Federal Health Privacy Rule um, originally provided when it was issued that privacy protections extended forever, uh, or as I love to say, until the sun run out, runs out of hydrogen. Um, that was deemed as protection that was too long, and they finally put in a rule of 50 years. Privacy after death in a lot of contexts is very complicated. Think about what happens to your Facebook page after you're dead, 
um, in other ways. But you know, the traditional view that privacy protections end at death um, is a simple rule, but it, uh, um, it doesn't help in a lot of contexts today. And uh, there could be, in some, in some circumstances, interests of relatives um, uh, who are affected by the information that's about you. Um, um, it's, it's not a simple thing and it can't be treated with just a simple, um, you're, you're alive and you have privacy, you're dead, you don't. Any other panelists have something to add? It's a, it's a deep philosophical question that I look forward to thinking more about, but I don't know the answer <laughs> okay. right now. Very interesting. Well, with that, with the last uh, moments, I would offer if any of you have any, some closing thoughts for our audience. Uh, I will, this is Bob, again, I, I'll say what I said before, when you have a privacy problem, you, if a law applies, you have to follow the law, but regardless of the law, you need to do the right thing and you need to figure out what the right thing to do is in your particular context. Anna? I think also sometimes law sounds very scary for people that are not uh, legal experts. So I would say just let's talk and reach legal people, but also people that are just doing it for passion and kind of crowdsource knowledge because it's really an unexplored field. And I think we need the experience of communities. So please join us at the working group ask, and also the ask a legal question too, that can be particularly helpful also for us to understand which kind of privacy concerns you as participants, you as project leaders may have. So please let's not be scared by the black letter of the law and just join the discussion on an even level, everybody, because we need experience from you and the kind of legal people need also to kind of dive into the real everyday concerns. Yeah, that's exactly right. We need to be grounded in, in what we're actually doing on the ground. So the group is definitely welcome to everybody who would like to join. Daniel. Um, yeah, I'll just say that um, we, we covered a huge amount of ground in that very short period of time. And so I think we only just barely touched the surface on a lot of really um, urgent, pressing questions. So if you were left with more questions than answers, um, please feel free to get in touch. Happy to point you to further resources. Uh, Daniel, Bob, and uh, Anna, if you would all put in your email addresses, if you're willing to share it so that people can reach out to you directly. And I, I agree, I think there's a substantial amount of information here that perhaps uh, starting in the summer, we might do some more deeper dives into these uh, specific issues. Um, I also thank you, Anna, for pointing out joining the group. I've added the link there. Uh, the Harvard Law Clinic has also volunteered. Um, so this is law students to answer questions. They're only for educational purposes only. However, they can't provide legal advice. And uh, our next webinar will be on February 24th, same time. Uh, we will be focusing on some of the case studies presented in the special issue of the Citizen Science Journal focused on policy perspectives. If, oh, great, somebody suggests they want more discussion on geoprivacy, then definitely we will organize that. Uh, look to the Citizen Science Association uh, YouTube channel for archived uh, video of this webinar and our previous webinars. Um, and with that, Rihanna, any last thoughts? Nope, thanks everyone. All right, thanks all. And thank you to our speakers. <laughs>